So we're about to get started, and I just want to tell you what we're about to do. And I'm only here to just to facilitate this process. Um, basically, I'm going to introduce just briefly the panel to you. They're going to give you sort of a three-minute context of who they are. They're really going to introduce themselves. Uh, who they are, what their context is around OER. I have a couple of questions to kind of just get us going because I know all of you will never be able to think about what you might want to ask them. Um, I'm just joking. Uh, so start, you know, start thinking, start writing now. And then really, this is a panel for them to be here as a resource for you. So kind of as Chris may have described this this morning, here's like your usability panel, right? Uh, but much more obviously than just the actual use, but the whole concept from micro. I know this whole group, we've, we've talked on the phone and we've met each other. They can talk from the micro to sort of the systems level of their environment of what they're doing. Obviously today it would be great to really focus on their practice because here we have just some uh, fabulous practitioners. Um, as such, uh, when we do do the, as soon as they introduce themselves and we start the questions, um, really think of your comments as questions. So I know you have a lot of your own experience and your statements, but let's really use them and try to get as many questions and dialogue as going as possible. So um, if that made sense. So great. So um, we'll just here start to my left, and why don't you just go down one by one, and they're going to tell us a little bit again. They'll introduce themselves. They'll give you the context of what they practice. And, and then we'll begin from there. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Well, keep talking, and we'll see. Okay. Can you hear me all right? No. All right, I'll talk really loud then. My name is Delana Tonks. I'm the director of the Open High School of Utah. We opened in 2009 with 125 ninth graders. We've got 259th and 10th graders this year, and next year we'll build out to grades 9 through 12 with 500 students, but we are uh, eligible to have up to 1,500 over the next three years. Our state caps enrollment, so that's not by choice, it's by mandate. We build our own curriculum from Open Educational Resources, and currently at ocw.openhighschool.org, you can find all of our ninth grade courses. Our 10th grade courses will be posted in September, and then a year from September, you'll have a full complement of nine through 12 uh, courses available to you. We're an online high school. We're a public charter school, which means we serve students from all over the state of Utah, and it's been a fun ride. Okay, so my name is Carrie Isgard. I'm from Whittier Union High School District, which is a school district in Southern California. We have about 13,000 students in our district. It's an urban slash suburban district at this point. Uh, as of two years ago, we had absolutely nothing online. We had teacher websites, uh, we had a few people doing a few things, but we had absolutely nothing district-wide as far as online course offerings or really any digital resources for students. So we are starting an effort to coordinate the online learning process to get things going. And the way we're doing that is starting at our alternative ed site. And we are transitioning to, uh, from an old school program, our, our alternative ed site used to be a lot like distance learning. You get a packet, you go home, you come back, you talk to a teacher who may or may not be a specialist in that subject area. Um, you take a test and you go home again. We're transitioning from that to a digital curriculum, and we're using a lot of OER to do that, partially because we don't have any money, but also because there is a lot of great stuff out there. And we're using a lot of the CK-12 resources, we're using a lot of NROC resources, and I'm also trading with other teachers from other schools that are doing the same thing. I have a World Civ class. Do you have a US history class? It's kind of like go fish. So we do that a lot. And what we're hoping to get out of this is we're hoping to increase our student engagement by using these digital resources. We're hoping to be able to differentiate more effectively, or at all. And we're hoping to give the students access to high quality teachers. By having the curriculum online, we're also giving them exposure to a highly qualified teacher in that field. So we're hoping to do that at our alternative ed site. We've started with our social studies curriculum. We're starting with some math. We now have some electives online. Um, so two years ago, we had nothing. Now we have about 12 to 15 courses and more in the works. And what we'd really like to do is we'd like to go district-wide, starting with using these programs for credit recovery district-wide 
and moving into a more systematic, hey, this is an option for any class you want to take. So that's what we're doing in Whittier. Uh, my name is Emily Morrison. I'm the Programs Manager for Artistic Learning at California Shakespeare Theater, uh, which is right over here in the East Bay. Um, we uh, do outdoor theater um, May through October, but year-round we have educational programs which serve around 6,500 students annually. Um, one of our main programs that I'm focused on is our residency program. I'm a teaching artist in that residency program and I also am an administrator for that. Um, currently, we are in 40 underserved schools, largely in the East Bay, um, and classrooms, I mean, some at the same school. And then we also have um, summer conservatories, um, which um, serve about 300 students each summer. Um, so. I've been an ISKME fellow for two years, um, and as a teaching artist, I'm learning, I'm, I'm starting to develop my own OER and share it with others and really serve as an ambassador um, to other fellow teaching artists to get them to engage in open, to post and publish their own curriculum and ideas and resources because I feel like the arts is a fairly underrepresented area. And, um, so that is my main focus right now. I'm eager to share ideas and collaborate with my fellows and um, all of you. My name is Deborah Cowden, and I'm a teacher. I'm in the classroom. I have a substitute yesterday and today. <laughs> and they are following my lesson plans, and I'll look forward to seeing my students tomorrow. And I also am looking forward to meeting with my principal. I saw him last night. We had open house, and so I wasn't able to stay last night. And. Uh, He's looking forward to our conversation, actually, and what I'm having here. I wish he were here, listening to you, talking with you. I know he's connected with uh, what goes on in OER. They do, so they have principal conferences, and uh, this is brought to him, but it's new. Um, I feel in, on my site, in my district, I'm very grassroots. It's very alone. Out there, I like developing my own curriculum as much as possible using OER materials. Um, and I've become involved with ISKME uh, through Big Ideas Fest in 09. Started connecting with OER, so I'm very new to OER as well. Um, my main teachers, if you will, for OER have been my students. Um, as I've been watching them, about three years ago, I noticed they have a lot to teach me on how they learn. And this has been my focus then, as I move forward uh, through this last year and into this year, of becoming more student-directed learning, um, project-based learning in a whole new way, using these materials and having them find things and develop um, curriculum as well. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to start with the first question. Uh, and it, there are a couple of people walking around with microphones here and there. So just raise your hand, and they'll give you a mic and get you up. So I, so I have a question. I'm going to kind of just dive right into it. Uh, so many times when we talk to administrators and other people about the concept of open, you know, they just say, oh, well, teachers don't really know how to create content. I mean, you know, maybe they can make some supplemental lessons, but they don't really, you know, they can't, they're not trained to do that. So I would just love to hear your response to that. Anybody can go. Go ahead. Okay, because I'm doing some of this. I think part of this, part is true, um, in, in that there's a lot that goes into developing a course. Um, and I, I really might have had a different opinion about that um, two years ago, but um, there, there's, in teacher training, I, I learned a lot about staying in the box. You know, being standards driven and, and that the book has the way to go, and this is the way we're going to do things, and end a discussion. In fact, we're not going to have a discussion. <laughs> this is the way it's going to happen. And um, what I've been learning from the students, though, is, of course, they can access information like we can. And the classroom can be very different. And so good course development and curriculum and so forth. And um, last year, I went to school myself online. I used an online. Uh, grad school and went to school last year to learn about course development and have a lot more insight into that now as well. I think also they don't understand how 
my teachers are already doing in the classroom. You're, you're in a classroom and you don't have what you need, so you just make it up already. Yeah. So it's not as if this is a new thing. The new thing is that now we can share it with other people. We can get stuff from other people. We can, we can network that way. We've been creating materials for a long time. Nobody ever gets a textbook and says, that's everything I need. <laughs> I won't need to go anywhere else or make anything up on my own. That just never happens. So it's already happening. That's not what we're facilitating. What we're facilitating now is, is the sharing and is the openness. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that uh, there needs to be a specific process in place. Teachers almost need permission to be able to share their stuff. It's easier to share within a district than it is outside of your district. Uh, districts feel a little bit more proprietary than individual teachers do. And I also think that it's overwhelming to build a course. If you went to a teacher and said, yeah, I need a World Civ course, can you just toss something together so that we can uh, share that out and, and get stuff back? That's not going to happen. But if you take it to a standards aligned granular level and ask a teacher to design a lesson plan around a standard that would be shareable, I think that you'd get better results by doing that. Questions from the audience? Thanks. We've heard a lot about the, the nature of content that's engaging, that wakes students up in the back of the room, being video and, and uh, exciting, moving content. Where have you seen that open, in particular, is making a difference for your teachers and your students? It, and are you seeing that? Okay, uh, we build the majority of ours from existing open educational resources. Uh, I was asked the question yesterday, what is the major reason why you don't choose a specific piece, and the reason is why is because it's boring. And I'll illustrate that with a, a quick story of a, a teacher methods class that I was in where the professor invited a student up to the front and had beautiful china and silverware and napkin and this gorgeous piece of cake that looked like it was to die for. And he asked for volunteers to come up and eat the piece of cake. So of course, everybody in the class wanted, wanted that. He chose a student, came up, they ate it, it was delicious. They had to share with everybody else how delicious it was. It was great. Then he asked for a second volunteer. Everybody's raising their hand. He calls on a student, comes up, grabs a piece of the, the cake and throws it down onto the same beautiful china, same silverware, same napkin, same setting, and said, here you go. And the student was a little repulsed by that. The delivery, the presentation is what matters, was the point of this lesson. I've never forgotten that. And what we have found is that you can toss the same content in a big chunk with links, text and links and pictures, and the kids start glazing over and it's not engaging to them. So what we've discovered is that the more clickable something is and the smaller the chunk, the more likely the student is to interact with that content and be able to make it engaging and uh, accessible and available to themselves. That ex oh. Go ahead. Yeah. Just, just in response to what, what Delana said, I, um, you know, I, I come at it from sort of a, a professional development um, standpoint because I'm not a classroom teacher in the classroom every day. And um, you know, what's funny is I, I find that some teaching artists are really reticent to share their precious warm-ups or their, their favorite game that they play to engage with the students because they, they fear that if I give this away, you know, this is what makes me special. This is what um, I have that, that makes me um, important. And I, I, I just keep encouraging them. I think that's a great example of, well, you know, you are the presentation when you're the teaching artist in the class. You, you know, the way that you're delivering it makes it special and makes it um, understandable for the students and makes it engaging. And the way that you are, are taking that content and delivering it back out to them um, and, and using it in the classroom, that's what that gives you the cred with the students, you know. So, but, but to have extra resources in your toolbox to pull out and, and to, to use and to be inspired by, I think that, that is so helpful to us all. As, as they get better, as I get better, you get better, we all get better. Anybody else want to respond to that, or should we go to the next question? Well, and I was thinking the small chunks is, is I, that's a nice way to put it, the small chunks. And um, because it can be used in so many different ways. It, it's not necessarily for one 
particular lesson. It can be used in so many ways and students can uh, see that as well. We're going to see this video again or, or they can refer back to media that they had um, for, for other purposes as well. So small chunks is big. One of the things you guys are talking about is sharing among teachers, and you guys are mostly classroom teachers, some supplemental educators, but one of the things I like to think about are all the other important players in a student's uh, learning experience, tutors, mentors, parents at home, and if you have any uh, experience sharing in those sort of small, tight-knit communities around individual learners, even if it's just you know what a student needs, uh, sharing with parents what you can do at home, things like that. If, if there is a need for uh, a method of communicating around a student or uh, just experience that you guys have had, uh, closing the loop of information, I guess, around students so that they're getting continuous education uh, at home in a learning center and in the classroom. No, I can speak to that. Um, at our alternative ed site, we have all at-risk kids, primarily students who were not successful in comprehensive high schools, and we do such a good job of that. We have students in small classrooms, we have them online, everyone's talking to, we have a master teacher who's their mentor, who's in, in charge of that student, who parents them, and, and all the information goes to them, and we do such a good job of that at, at that particular site. We're a very small staff. We have 12 people on staff. We have about 430 students. And I think that the size facilitates that sharing. The problem is when we go to our comprehensive high schools, which have 2,000 students, 3,000 students, that disappears. And there's no real mechanism for a social studies teacher to talk to an algebra teacher about what the heck happened with that kid, you know? There's no, there is no family. That's what we have at the alternative ed site that helps the kids so much. So trying to move that from one environment to another is another one of the challenges that we have. Because it is very effective, it's a very powerful tool, that communication between the people involved in the student's life. Is there a way we could use technology somehow? Is there a way we could use technology somehow? Just doing the work face to face? I think a lot of it is a matter of getting the to be interested enough to, <laughs> to take advantage of what's available. We have a parent portal where the parents can go in and see, you know, 100% of the curriculum. Online delivery facilitates that. Uh, but ask me how many of my parents actually <laughs> do that. Uh, but come to me with questions that they could easily solve by logging in and taking a look themselves, wh which is fine. So I think the paradigm needs to shift to, to involve the parents more. Uh, outreach and education, which we do monthly outreach meetings for the parents to answer their questions and, and help facilitate that process, but absolutely we should leverage the technology to make that happen. I'd like to add, Angelina, specifically at, at your uh, institution where it is deliberately open, and, and I'm curious what their, the parents' relationship or interaction or understanding is of that specifically. Quite a few of our parents who come to the school specifically because they're already open source technology fans. So the fact that that has spilled over into the education arena is very exciting to them. Uh, we, again, in our outreach programs and at our orientations and with our newsletters that go out, try to create awareness of what open is and why it's important and the teachers articulate that you know with a textbook you can't rip out a chapter if it's not working and toss it out but with open open uh, curriculum you can it's not proprietary and we use the data behind it to be able to see which lessons are working again on a very granular level standards aligned this standard is being met and it takes uh, we've got five different activities that go with this standard they're doing a great job what happens if we take two of those away are they still getting it is less more so we use that data to, to massage how we present the the curriculum and then try and make the parents aware of that and I think they're very happy because it allows us to customize the educational experience for our students Oh, right here, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, so I was uh, just curious about this question that was uh, raised about privacy versus openness and uh, your reflections in the classroom regarding the willingness of uh, teachers either anonymously or by name to share what they know or what they're doing uh, with other teachers in the public or, or other issues like that and what, what we might do to, 
to encourage that or to make it a safe space or, or anything along those lines? You know, in our district, we have uh, district-wide common assessments, which doesn't seem like it's related, but it is. Be because everyone's goal is, of course, to get their students to do as well as they can possibly do on these common assessments. And what's that, what that's really done is open the door for sharing all those best practices. Like, well, your kids got a 98% average on, what the heck, did you just tell them the answers? I mean, how'd you do that? So people are actively going to other people. And to be honest, in our district, we've been really lucky. People are really willing to share. They're happy to tell what they're doing. Mostly they want to brag about it. Because we're not going to the people who did poorly and saying, well, what, what's up with you? We're going to the people who did well and saying, hey, you want to brag about this for a while? Let's share. Let's be open about this. So it's really working in a positive reinforcement way. And they're very happy to do that. But it's all happening within the district. So we have yet to branch out and make that statewide. So, so my question is related to that. Um, this is Jim. Um, because I was going to ask, um, how do we get better at sharing practice? You know, if I look at all, I love free stuff and I love uh, open sharing uh, of free stuff. But as I look at projects around the world that are really moving the needle on student achievement, it seems to be less about the content sharing and more about changes in uh, pedagogical practice. You know, so I'm, I'm thinking, how do we like create an open pedagogy repository or something that can beyond a school district yeah. or even within a school I, more effectively share somewhere. practice? Any any ideas? I mean, well, I think it does take time. That was mentioned earlier. It, there's time involved, and after so, if you have a classroom teacher is going to be adding to con, you know content or registry and things like that, this takes time, and in in my vision, you know, I would love to have a hub right on my campus where we could put our stuff, we could talk about it ourselves, and then it could go out. Because wanting it to be good, wanting it to be excellent, what we'd put out there, um, would might feel a little safer as well. Um, so something at the district le or school site level, and that could then branch out and offer up to district, you know, county, state, Yep. yep. It, might, it might be interesting too to hear some examples um, just of how you have tried to share and maybe where you've had difficulties or how you've gotten around them. That might be insightful yeah, well, too. Yeah. I, I would love to say I have a lot of positive. Um, I'll start with the positive. The, the positive side would be with parents. With what I'm doing in the classroom, I, I get very positive feedback and their, their children. Very positive feedback. That feeds me to keep waking up in the morning, keep doing what I do. Um, from teachers that I work with, it's still scary. The concept of, uh, there's still misconceptions. Um, you're gonna, you know, I'm gonna lose my job. Um, you're gonna give them all a computer and they're all gonna do their, their courses online. You don't need me anymore and I retire, you know, my, I've got, leave me alone. <laughs> and, and don't tell me what you're doing and I won't tell you what I'm doing. So it's encouraging to hear where there's these positives and, um, so heading in those directions and allowing those conversations uh, to happen. Um, does, does that answer yeah. your question? Anybody else want to comment to that? Take another question. I'm, I'm curious about the social piece of OER and if you have any examples of maybe people that you would have never connected with if it wouldn't have been for your work with OER and, and what, what came out of that? speak to that. As a fellow, I think I've been introduced to um, a wide array of, of teachers in all sorts of specialty areas and, um, and just through the wiki that we interface um, with uh, through ISKME, we are sharing our ideas and best practices and collaborating on new, new ideas and, um, and seeing how they could work cross-country projects right now. Um, there's this wonderful uh, teaching artist who specializes in visual art in Montana. And she has a bus and she drives it all over Montana. It's like a, a mobile art gallery. And she takes it to these really remote areas and, and sets it up and teaches the students there about um, art and history and, 
and culture from, from the viewpoint of visual art. And I was introduced to her through open educational resources and through the fellowship. And um, hopefully this spring and summer, we're gonna be piloting uh, a, a project where um, my students in my summer program will, will participate in, um, in filming some of their, their work. And then Allison will have her students respond to it in a visual art way, a sort of call and response um, methodology. And then my students will look at her visual art and then create a new theater piece based on their reactions to her visual art. And so that kind of um, cross, you know, state borders and, you know, um, cross specialities would have never happened if it weren't for, for OER and, and just the collaboration that is fostered um, in this environment. Go Fish game. Uh, we, t we trade courses with even our ones that haven't been released yet. We'll do a pre-release if somebody's got something to share back with us. Uh, for example, in New Zealand with the earthquake, we shared some of our curriculum that hadn't been released yet. And I'll see your U.S. history class and raise you uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> a world mm -hmm. uh, And when you're making a decision about what materials to use for a new class, you're, you're just you're making the decision, I'm, am I going to go with a publisher material? Am I going to go with something open? And if you go with the publisher material, it ends at that class. And sometimes we make that decision, and, and sometimes that's the de decision that's best for us. But if you make the decision to go with the open class, well, then somebody else tells you, hey, I heard about this, and now you know about this. And now suddenly you don't have just this one open class. You have a whole curriculum and a network of people who are going to give you more stuff. And it's very exciting. It, one of the things we're talking about is that many teachers are reluctant to take the first steps, but once they do, like yourselves, then it's a really transformative experience. So I wonder, um, in your experiences in, in your own lives, as well as in you know, being evangelicals for this cause, what is the most persuasive argument to get someone from a place of fear to a place of acceptance and engagement, yourselves or uh, your colleagues? I'm really curious to know like what works to get someone on board. Uh, show me the money. Yeah. Show them what you've done and so that they can see it because there's the perception out there that, well, if it's free, it can't be that good. But we also have great examples with Wikipedia and other open source projects that have taken off and you, you just have to be able to show what you've done and then it, it helps. And we're still, fight, I'm still fighting the, 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 the move to digital curriculum. I'm not, I'm not even evangelizing for open yet. I'm still, could you open the computer? Just, it's not scary. So, um, but I think any little bit of data that you have that you're able to get, that you're, you're able to brag about and support your cause with, that's the most convincing. You know, if I can show people, look how much more effective it is. Let's not talk about the cost. Let's not talk about where I got it. Look at how effective it is. Then they don't really care where it came from. They really don't. And I've been using it with, within the box that we already have. So within the curriculum that we have, within the uh, content um, or course management system that we have, that our school uses, um, showing how I can link courses. Uh, the students all have pages, and parents have access to this as well. So basically what I do on a daily basis ends up online. I have a... Um, and this comes down then to classroom equipment, what I have available. And so what I do have is a scanner that can record what I show on my overheads, my notes. I, I can record things. Those can then be saved, and I can upload it um, to be on, on a, a day. This is what happened today. So this is a whole new thing from this last year, as I've been, and I've had to learn how to use this and how to do it, how to store it. And this all just takes time, and then show it. is effective is showing what the teacher's time looks like if the content is housed, I mean if it's open and it's housed in a digital arena, the teacher isn't standing up doing the same thing six times in a secondary setting. They're tutoring and mentoring and why do people go into teaching? Is it because they like redundancy? They like doing the same thing six times? No. They want a mentor, they want a tutor, they want to spend that individual time with the, the student and when teachers apply at my school that's one thing that I look for when I hire them is that motivation, why did you become a teacher? And if that's why, then they really like the, the open digital content for that reason.
I love this idea about using data to brag. I think so often teachers are, you know, data's all about the punitive, what didn't you do? And so I think if you could start this, you know, data to brag campaign for OER, it would probably be, it would probably be very useful. Next question. Could you guys just address um, what OER is not doing for you? Uh, you know, sort of, this is when I talk to students in schools, I'll say, no school is perfect. What do you wish a school would do better or differently? They always say lunch. But um, what, for you guys, when you look at, at OER, what do you wish it would do that it isn't doing, that, that developers, that you know, user experts, that funders, that policymakers could, could do to accelerate this for you guys? Reducing class sizes. <laughs> it's not giving me more technology. It's not, you know, those are still needs. They're still serious needs that there's no way a new content is going to address. And they're, they're huge hurdles. But also, it's more time consuming in, in many cases to use open source stuff because you have to track it down, you have to make it fit. In the end, you get a better product, but when you're looking at a 24 hour day, how much time does a teacher have? So it, it's, it's better, but it's not easier than using a publisher material. Well, that's true. I agree with that. <laughs> so, so better, not easier. That's what I just heard. OK. Well, if it were more searchable, where you could search by standard or by small chunk or by module or badge or whatever you want to call that, uh, Teachers don't have time to go out and, and cull through massive amounts of resources. It's not that there aren't resources. It's that trying to find the one that's going to be the best fit for you is tough. So it's interesting because we've seen, you know, from the textbook that has everything that's just not so useful to go find it all yourself, it's there. Um, there are some packages of things still that are OER, but that still isn't... Um, maybe small enough pieces. So I'm seeing that there's a need, I, I, I'm kind of hearing, in the absence of what you're saying, sort of this need in the, of, that, of that range, somewhere between, you don't need to package the whole OER curriculum for me, um, but I need it modular, but not so much that I have to go do all this work to find it. Would that be, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's kind of what I'm hearing. OER librarian where we can submit a, here's what I'm looking for, I want it to look like this, I want it to have these attributes, I want it to meet these standards, go find it for me and give me three choices. Yeah. That's what I would like. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny Any you that. Yeah. We, we have a little experiment going on right now and you should, and it's, it's just an, it's an offering to the community, we don't know how it will work, but um, if you're on Twitter, uh, there's, a, there's a, an account we called, we, we just created called OER Lib, so OER L-I-B. Wait, what is it? It's OER librarian. I am sorry. Here, here, here she, here is our <laughs> OER librarian. You are trouble. So it's OER librarian. And here's what happens. If you tweet to there and you use the hashtag, hashtag OER lib, right? Uh, or you can send a direct reply to OER librarian. Any of us could crowdsource the answer back to you. So it's not just, you know, the isk me librarian people. But anybody here or anybody anywhere could then see that and then recommend their resources. So try it out. Basically, the way it works right now is when you do that hashtag OERLib, it should show up in actually the search stream. We didn't actually announce it because there was a few little strange tweaks with it. But essentially, if you reply to OER librarian, it will for sure be there. And then it will be instantly retweeted. So it's just an example, again, it's not for just us to use, it's for any, let's try it, it's an experiment. We'd love for you to use it and break it and create something else or tell us how to make it better, but that's just sort of the concept. But anyway, she wasn't a plant, but I'm glad you said that. Yeah. What, what else? Well, I think it's young. It, it's just, it's still young, and there's still a lot of information out there that we can just go to, but what I don't like, I like just using YouTubes maybe for a video. Well, one, they're, they're not always excellent. They're not always good. There's a lot of chatter below that is not classroom appropriate um, and can't be trusted because it could be good on the day that I posted, but when the students see it the next day or, you know, God forbid, if a parent saw it or the, you know, but it needs to be that visible. Um, so there's, there's work there to be done. Um, you know, saying I, I will re 
video those things on, and rehash it myself, work it. Um, but that all takes time too. Maybe it's just a time thing as well. This, as OER grows up, all these things going out, maybe it's not anything is bad, or maybe it's all positive, or just more is going to come along, and these smaller chunks are going to be available and get remixed together. We need more high school. If anybody's doing that, that'd be cool. Right. <laughs> yeah. I adapt a lot of high school yeah. material. I adapt a lot of community college stuff because it's really good yeah. stuff, but it takes a lot of work to adapt that to a credit recovery student. A lot. Other questions? Yes. Hi, uh, Simon Buckingham from the Open University in the UK. Um, one of the hallmarks of schools that seem to be doing some of the most powerful work is that they really empower the students to get into an inquiry of some sort, um, often one that, about a topic that they really care about as opposed to one they've been handed. Yeah. Um, and then you figure out uh, how, you, how you're going to stretch them and, uh, around the learning when they're really engaged. Um, so I'm wondering, would open educational resources to help teachers design real authentic inquiry activities be something you would recognize as important is that that may or may not be something that that you're doing or it may be but you know your colleagues aren't because that's not what they learned how to do when they were trained just would just value your 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 sense around this whole idea of authentic inquiry for learning and whether that, that's a real need for oer you know i think professional development in general is a gaping hole in um in most of the oer i use so yes Anything that trains teachers how to use digital resources more effectively, that would be great. And once there's a bigger base, what you're talking about would be a lot easier to accomplish. At this point, we're just gathering stuff to, to put it into a repository to have something. Once there are enough somethings, then that inquiry base will be a lot easier. Can you all say more about what you mean or what it looks like to offer training to educators about how to use OER resources? And also, um, how do you as educators think about your role as OER creators and your students' role? Go ahead. All righty. <laughs> Um, on the how, I, I'm, I think I'm kind of in a, I live in a OER utopia because I, we're online, we're the open high school of Utah, we started from the ground up, I hired all the teachers, we audition them, we give them a source, uh, a list of resources, a list of technology, and a list of standards and say build a lesson plan, 140 out of the 150 don't bother, so my job's really easy because I only have to look at 10. That's not the case for everybody, so I, I feel your pain if that's not the case for you. But once they come in, or if anybody shows an interest in open educational resources, we have a little bit of pro professional development, just screencasts of how to put lesson plans together and where to find resources and uh, kind of a step-by-step -step process, which I think is appealing to teachers. Step one, I mean, if you say build a lesson plan, people flounder, but if you give them step-by-step -step instructions, then it helps them out a little bit. And, and those are, I mean, those are available on our website, openhighschool.org that it needs to be, the process needs to be defined and stepped so that it's not vague. Yeah, it has to be, just like we were saying with the student materials, easy and short. They can do a little bit at a time. For um, the teaching artists that we hire to um, teach our summer training programs in different disciplines like movement and voice and text and um, Shakespeare history, stage combat, I piloted last year um, our own Ning um, for my summer teaching artists um, who are working with a variety of student age levels at a variety of different locations. And uh, we tried a professional development um, during our orientation day, one day, um, where I just demoed, you know, how to set up your Ning profile, how to access and post information, how it could be very beneficial to be like a virtual bulletin board for us to share information. You know, similarly, like you were saying, you, we're all interacting with this particular student. How are we affecting that student throughout the day? How do they do? How are they growing as a performer? How are they interacting with their peers? 
And I would say it was um, that I w am willing to try it again, but I think that from that one day of training, probably maybe a third of my teaching artists were able to quickly pick it up, adopt it, use it, post pictures of things that were inspiring them in their production and the time period that they were setting it, um, share ideas and, and games that they were playing or activities that they were doing in their different classes, and then other people just didn't go, go to it at all. You know, and, and other teachers were like, well, we like a bulletin board like this graffiti wall in the back where we can just easily see it and on our way out scribble a couple of notes and, and put it up that way. So, you know, again, artists um, and technology don't always go together. So I think that that's like my, one of my biggest struggles is trying to just break it down, make it as easy as possible, make it a step-by-step -step process, make it fun. And for the for the teachers, if it's not fun for the teachers, you're not going to have a lot of buy-in either. So it's like it, you have to make them want to spend a few extra minutes sharing what they're going through during the day, um, and make it worth it for them in some way, shape, or form. So. I think it's about. Uh, I agree with all this, and just to add to it, it's building vision. Um, most of the people, the teachers I work with. We're not 21st century learners, we're, we're 20th century. And we're straddling, you know, this concept of digital learning versus what we might call old school. Or from their point, our point of view, because I would include myself in that, is regular, normal. Um, this, this whole digital, and, and it would be called stuff, the new fandangle, the why do we need it? Um, when this has worked well for me and my children, and and for centuries or whatever. Um, so building vision and providing um, some audiovisual that can come to a professional development, not to say you're gonna do it this year, but to try and build that hook, prick their hearts, if you will, that they might become motivated. And that where there's one, then maybe at a site there become three. And then we've got a collaborative team who are willing to work after hours or, and so forth. Other question? I'm, I'm wondering to the degree that you're using some open resources and some resources that aren't open, if you can speak to the two issues of do you feel like you're actually saving money by you, when you use open resources? Or does it cost just as much to use open resources or does it cost more? And if you can speak to any issues of how you think learning is differing and, and if there's a, a kind of theoretically grounded reason why you think that kids are learning more when they're interacting with the OERs compared to the other materials? I can speak to the first one really easily. Um, yes, we've saved money. Um, you could say that open resources are free, but of course the district has to pay me, and I have to put it all together, and I'm not cheap. But, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna go there. Anyway, um, so yeah, there's a cost. There's an inherent cost all the time, all the labor. It's really intense. Um, and then as far as the second one goes, is it more effective than the publisher material? You know, we are, we are in our infancy. I may have data about that later. I have a couple of programs that, uh, one of them is one of Gary's classes that we're piloting from NROC um, that I can compare to a traditional class, but, but I'm also comparing that to a traditional delivery, so that's a little misleading. Um, it, it's going really well, but it, it, it's going better than the traditional class, which was tanking. So I need more data. I can't really speak to that yet. Um, maybe next year at this time I will be able to, but we're optimistic. Any other examples of evidence of the difference in OER? Uh, obviously with ours, there's an upfront cost because we hire the curriculum developers the year before and they spend that year building. So there's a, a frantic, uh, frenzy gathering stage and then they shape the material and then after that they, it's tweakage. They tweak it and adapt to fit the needs of the students. So there is an upfront cost, but over the long term, we're not gonna have to get the second edition of the the OER course, we, we just, there's continual improvement, uh, a process in place for that. So e eventually, yes, it will be cheaper. And then David, to your second question on the data, 
uh, we use both open and a handful of, of uh, proprietary specifically for the AP courses because of the process it takes to get them approved by the AP board. Uh, eventually we will look at building our own, but for now those are, those are proprietary. And I would say I like the OER courses better. I think the meet the students needs better. Um, and the data that we have, our test scores from the state mandated tests were 10 points above the state average for English and science. That was in our first year. Uh, the math scores were, were fairly close. We've taken a look at the data and figured out some things that we can do to make that course better. So we're hoping for better math scores for this year. Um, but yes, on both counts, cheaper and better. I mean, I know you had an example just because I've heard it just of, and here's a small unit, right, just a classroom and a class, but a class that basically, maybe you could talk about what it was, and maybe I'm misquoting you, that uh, it went from half participation to overflowing. Right, right, right. and it, I would speak to this from the point of view that this is the way these students learn, going back to the 20th versus the 21st century learners. And I actually am quoting one of my sixth grade students when they saw these 24 laptops that um, I was awarded from the 2009 Big Ideas Fest from one of the presenters. And um, they came into the classroom, they're all in the back of the classroom, and some of the kids that were not going to be using these laptops, because it's a one-to-one -one program, were standing there, and they were like, this, Ms. Calvin, this is just the greatest thing. And as you know, I just wanted to glean from this, and I was like, well, why? Why would you think this is so great? And what it came down to was, well, this is just the way we do things. And I, and I thought, there, he's absolutely right. This is just the way they do things. And as I sat with that and have worked with this, I started to, it became my impetus for what you're talking speaking to. So I started putting more and more of my <laughs> coursework online. So the students would come into the classroom, we would do some face-to-face, -face, but then they'd get right to work. And I recognized the different types of learners, all their needs are met. The kinesthetic learners are your toughest in a, in a regular classroom setting. You want them up and moving around. But just give them the mouse <laughs> and to click through their choices. And they're accessing information and creating. And this is where we saw these test scores when I gave the, the tests later. Um, comparatively, one was 35% completed the course completely. This was normal. These were at-risk students. And after doing complete coursework online, it was 98. And, and I just found that, I thought, well, let me do this again, because <laughs> this seems, but they engage in their learning. They become responsible for their, they're interested. This is the way, and I go back to the sixth grader. This is the way they do things. And they, I think they feel, felt respected at a certain level. You know, thank you very much that it's not coming just from me, you know, and, and, it's, and it's no disrespect to me. They, they just appreciate that they can learn the way their brains seem to be wired. We have time for maybe one more question. Anybody else who hasn't asked a question yet, perhaps? Somebody else who hasn't asked a question. Come on, you have a burning question. OK, here's our last question. It better be, better be good. I think it's relevant. Um, so one of the things is I think so many people in the community at large want to help teachers, but don't necessarily know how. So I, my question to you is, if you had a way to put a call out to a community of parents, of just supporters in the, in, um, around your schools, how they could help? Is it curating materials? Is it lending time? Is it you know, supervising? Is it being mentors? Just what's the best way, uh, I guess, to contribute to the well-being of a, a teacher and to make your life easier and your the amazing work you do more effective. And if we can facilitate it any way, shape, or form, uh, let's do it and figure out how. Great question. Let's hear. Should we just start? Let's start. start and here. Okay, yeah, so yeah, we'll start and we'll work up. <laughs> okay, so for me, even like at the 2009 Big Ideas Fest, when Internet Archive was studying their great online books, and I was so excited, you know, um, my thing is, well, that'd be great, but I need laptops. You know, and now that I have the laptops, well, 
now I need cameras and I need middies and, <laughs> and it comes down to equipment because this is the request of the students, what they want to do and what they want to produce. The authentic assessment goes big when you have the equipment that, that they can use and then posting online and um, I'd like to have more different types of websites I could use. Uh, I do have a Ning that I, uh, that I use, but there is cost involved in that, so if they wanted to provide that type of support as well, this would be great. And then the IT the, the support. Emily? For me, I, I think it's just, you know, especially parents and administrators being willing to in, uh, become part of the conversation. You know, uh, and, and to find space and time for students' voices to be heard, for them to present their work, for the parents to ask them questions, for the administrators to acknowledge what the, the teachers are doing in, in their classrooms and what, what Cal Shakes as an outside provider is, is directly bringing into the classroom and the different kind of experience that they're having because of that. Um, by the way, you can come send, see me about the kinesthetic learning anytime. And, um, and, and, but for really just to provide, we've had this great um, opportunity um, recently to, to open up um, our, our unit of curriculum to uh, a community conversation. And so we've just, certain schools that we have certain traction in and we say, hey, can we ask, can we have the uh, multi-purpose room for one night? Can we provide pizza and, and some drinks and have the parents come in and see a little bit of the showcase and, and then engage in some of what the process was? Because a lot of what Cal Shakes does is not about creating the most brilliant actors out there for the next century. You know, it's more about it's teaching 21st century skills. It, it's about working as a team in collaboration. It's about creating confidence in a student to speak publicly. It's about you know engaging and inspiring their imagination and, and creating empathy for others and all of that stuff. And and to have the parents come in and participate, you know, in in that dialogue of how that's happening you know, through this process that they've just been engaged with, that's, that's huge. But to have the time and the space to do that is sometimes difficult. And to uh, piggyback on what Deborah was saying about the IT, there are a lot of people in the community, there are a lot of people in this room who know a lot more about IT than your average teacher who is 50 years old and doesn't even know how to begin putting their website together, but their principal told them they had to. So to offer to go in, hey, you know, I know a little bit about tech. Could I put your website together with you? Do you have any quizzes that you want me to load online? Is there any material that I could help you with? To have someone from a community who has an expertise in that background. Um, I think traditionally teachers get offers from help and they think that you mean, will you staple these together for me tonight, you know? <laughs> but no, they don't even know what to ask for. They don't know to ask that they need help with their website. They need help putting resources online. They don't know that they don't know how to do that. It, 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 it's not even a skill that crosses their mind most of the time. So as a community of tech savvy people to offers for help need to be very specific and need to be tech oriented. And, and believe me, they can use the help. They just don't know it. <laughs> Hey, Delita, you get the last word here. All right, I agree with everything that's been said, and the only thing I have to add is that uh, parental support of their students doing their work in school is uh, key to being successful. So just help your student out, double check, make sure they're doing what they're doing, be informed, be involved, make sure you know what's going on at your kid's school. All right, round of applause for our teachers.